So yeah, welcome everyone, and, and thanks for running back after lunch to, to, to come and hear uh, what, what we're doing and our, and our plans. Um, so we've obviously grown quite a bit since I first started and just before I started as well. Um, this is great. Uh, it means we are able to have more staff, have more support, and actually help drive the project forward. As a indication, um, these are the kind of figures we've been looking at for our expenses and the 2019 expected um, expenditures as well. Um, so we've kind of gone from a 250k organization to about uh, what's expected to be around 1 million uh, this year, uh, which is a really impressive growth rate and it's had some challenges that have come with that, but it's also been a really exciting time for the foundation. Um, what I'll do in this talk is I'll kind of briefly talk through the sort of the priorities and our goals in the long term and some of the strategies we're going to use to get there. Um, and then I will talk a little bit more about the, uh, the competition that uh, we announced yesterday. Uh, but I'm also very interested to hear from everyone here to see if anyone has any questions or um, it's your sort of chance to ask me anything you want about um, the foundation and, and, and how it works and, and, and what our plans are. So I'll just start with our purpose. Um, this is kind of the aim of the foundation. Um, this is our charitable purpose. It's filed with the IRS. This is what allows us to be a publicly supported charity. And it's to, we broaden access through technology, through development and distribution of free computer software, uh, desktop software, and particularly with an emphasis on countries around the world where operable computers would have been unavailable or prohibitively expensive. Now, this does not necessarily mean uh, emerging markets, developing nations. It can mean uh, places in the US, for example. So if you are a library and you can't afford to install the latest Microsoft Active Directory server or something, then this is an option for you. If you are somewhere that, say, you, for whatever reason, you don't want to send your personal data over the internet to a third party provider, then this is an option for you as well. And so this is the aim of the foundation. This is what we're trying to do. So from the board, I've received ten, so sort of three high-level 10-year goals of, of, of what we're trying to achieve. So one is to have a sustainable project and sustainable foundation. One is to increase our user base, and then to also have wider awareness through, through, through leadership. And I'll talk briefly about each of those and kind of the areas we're, we're trying to address there. So under the Sustainable Project Foundation, our sort of strategies here is to sustain and increase funding levels, obviously. Uh, we want to be able to carry on having the, the staff we, we have at the moment and the ability for this, the support that that gives to the project, um, but also to increase that as well. Um, so we're able to do more, have more staff potentially, and kind of grow as, a, as an organization. Um, and there's, there's various things we can do around there, so uh, looking at advisory board members and who we have uh, coming along there. We also want to grow our individual donations through the Friends of Gnome program and, and other programs as well. Uh, for anyone who isn't a friend of Gnome, please go sign up and be a friend of Gnome. You will receive a lovely email from Molly uh, once a month with all the stuff that we've been up to in the foundation and that makes people happy, and it makes Molly happy when we get lots of feedback and, and things like that as well, so please do that. And obviously, we're looking at grants and things we can do around that, so this is not necessarily the ones we've received. We also continue to look at other opportunities as well. Um, there are a number of grants available, and we're looking at some of those and how we can uh, use some of those to make GNOME a better desktop. Um, we're also looking to increase the number of contributors. Um, and we want to attract and retain a diverse core contributor base here. And we have various methods for that. So we have outreach, the diversity and inclusion. Uh, we have newcomers initiatives, which is a fantastic project. So it allows people to come aboard and, and, and be mentored in, in what they do. 
We also have improved contribution flows and communications tools. So we've recently seen the move to GitLab, which I know personally I've just found so much easier to contribute to GNOME and actually do things like fix bugs since it has been on GitLab and it, it becomes a lot easier for people to do so. Um, I think we still have some more work to do on our contribution tools. Um, I'm not sure how many people here you know or have used our, well put your hand up if you know and have used our discourse instance. Some, so we've got about 50%. So for those who don't know, we have a discourse instance. Uh, this, all the GTK mailing lists moved over to discourse. Um, we've seen, I think it's fair to say, about in the first two months of discourse, um, we had more interactions in there than the previous entire year of the GTK mailing lists all combined. Um, so we're getting some really good traction there. Um, I also think we need to start moving some of our, our other mailing lists over towards discourse as well. Um, it is a lot better way of actually communicating with each other. That's not to say if you really want to interact and just use things as a mailing list and use your email, that's still fine. You can still interact with discourse using email, but it is something I think we need to seriously consider as a, a better way of, of having conversations. The other thing we need to do, um, continue to do, some of this has already started, but we need to, to carry on with it, is to uh, create and sustain infrastructure for foundation staff. We're, we're moving from essentially having me and Rosanna to actually having lots of staff members, and this requires things like having employment contracts and having regular meetings with people and providing mentoring, opportunities for growth, ensuring people can, can get personal development. And we have things like appraisals and goal setting and setting pay rates. And, and this is something that is coming along simply by having more staff. It, it's, it's an important thing that we need to carry on and do. So on our increased user base, so we want to foster a, a vibrant uh, Linux desktop application system. Um, so this is about raising interest in, in the whole ecosystem for applications. And we want to facilitate app development and distribution models. And we want to uh, also investigate potential new funding models. So uh, there's a couple of examples here. Is we have uh, Linux App Summit coming up in November in Barcelona, which we're co-hosting with KDE. And the aim here is to try and grow um, overall the people developing for, um, for GNU Linux desktop systems and trying to really reach out and, and improve that. We have other core things here around, um, around Flatpak and Flathub and the potential there for possibly even a donation system through that model and various models around there to able to kind of increase our reach and also make things more sustainable. We also want to uphold our reputation as the most accessible desktop. Um, it is a personal priority of mine to ensure we have excellent accessibility. Um, I simply feel that if you have a requirement for accessibility, it is simply wrong that you are required to use a proprietary solution or pay for something so you can access computing. And we have various methods here, so we're going to look at usability studies, we're going to look at um, use cases, and I think when we're all designing uh, the desktop and designing our, our modules and applications, we really need to be accessible by default. This isn't something we can just add in later, it's something that should be on the forefront of our mind. We also want to support improving the basic functions of a desktop uh, for everyone. So. Uh, there's a emphasis on things like translations and making sure that works well, uh, making sure things like uh, improvements for high-end and low-end hardware. So I hesitate to use the word performance because it's an overloaded term and everyone uses that all the time, um, but ensuring that the experience is smooth and things work well on many devices. And then some simple things like reducing the number of crashes we have to make sure that things are stable and people can rely on us. Um, and also an emphasis on improving documentation and our, our basic help, our, the ability for people to interact and, and find out um, how to use the desktop and how to use our tools as well. We, we have this, uh, a goal of a, a sort of 10-year goal of a wider awareness, 
awareness through leadership. So this is about uh, making sure that people are aware of what we do and aware of GNOME and also that we continue to innovate in, the, in this area. So a lot of this is, um, a lot of these strategies we're, we're employing here is to go talk about GNOME and go and talk about our technologies at non-free software circles. So it is going out to places that, for example, um, going to CES or IBC or some of the trade shows where a lot of uh, our tools are being used. Um, so for example, going talking about GTK rather than GNOME as a desktop, going to places and explaining that, that we use. So I was in um, OzCon recently and we talked to a few companies and they said, oh, well, we don't use GNOME. It's like, well, have you heard of GStreamer, LibXML2? Dbus, anyone? And go, well, yeah, we use all of those. Like, well, you are using our technologies then, and we need to be better at talking about some of those things and how these interact and provide value for organizations. So hopefully, they can see the value in that and then give us some money so we can continue doing what we do. Um, we, as part of this, we want a larger GNOME presence at conferences as well. So going to places that we haven't been, but also um, sort of expanding our role and actually having representations. So over the last uh, year, I think we've had 10 different conferences which we've attended. So either with a booth or with staff or um, trying to support and sort of be more um, approachable and be more visible to, to the communities in general. We also want to improve things like our graphic design and our brand guidelines. I think a lot of the, um, lot of the strength we've had uh, as GNOME has been we actually care about design and things do look good. And then also that goes into our, um, our marketing as well and being able to, to do some of that. And, and things like we also want to improve our support for community outreach. So going to places that, that we haven't traditionally been. Um, and some of this is, involves literally going and doing workshops in places and being able to support that. It also means potentially um, moving Guadec beyond Europe, so moving it to places where we can have a huge impact. Another thing which, we, which is kind of one of our, our main strategies as well is to become an exemplary FROS community. Um, there's a strong emphasis on diversity and inclusion. We have a diversity and inclusion team, um, which is details on the wiki, and there's, I think, a few people around here who are in the diversity and inclusion teams here. Uh, we want to have a global reach so we can get some of, um, so we can get the experiences of many uh, different people into the project. We want to have the welcoming and provide onboarding support, as I mentioned, to newcomers initiatives, and we want to make it easy to contribute. Some of the um, areas that I think we, we, we're kind of looking at, as I was mentioned in the AGM, is we have a new code of conduct coming out in I probably the coming months, I think, so very soon now, um, and, and that's an important thing. And I think, we, I think there's still work to be done here. Um, I do worry sometimes when some of the effort, some of the languages we use and some of the way we interact within the project and also to external organizations have not been optimal. So we have seen some cases where there is essentially been blog posts ranting about something else and that is not a way that is actually constructive and that's not going to change anything. So just going on a rant and saying this is all terrible isn't going to change anyone's opinion and isn't going to change any, anyone's mind. And what we can do there is I can help and our staff can help. What we can do is we can actually have conversations, we can change that messaging so, you're, so the thing you want to happen is more effective. And this is something that, that we're starting to see a shift for but we need to continue working on. We want to also evaluate and adopt new technologies. Um, so we want to encourage innovation and what I would call controlled experimentation. So we don't want to just go mad and break everything and, and everything changes and goes wrong, but we do want to consider how we, we use the desktop, 
how our competitors use the desktop, so seeing what happens on Mac OS, seeing what happens on Windows, and working out what bits we need to adapt and where we need to keep going. Uh, at the moment, for example, there is no answer as to what is the answer for GNOME for Siri on the desktop. And do we, in fact, want there to be an answer for a virtual assistant on the desktop? But by evaluating our um, competitive desktops, then we get to actually have a look at this and decide and then keep up the pace um, to make sure we can continue to innovate. We also want to ensure that we have a reduction of um, technical debt and our legacy technologies as well. So a lot of our effort is goes into some of, some of that to make sure that it is easier to contribute, but also that the maintenance burden is lowered. Um, so moving quickly on to the next bit. Um, for those that didn't see the AGM yesterday, uh, we have been very fortunate. Uh, we've had a generous fa uh, half a million dollar grant from Endless. Um, and the aim of this is to um, do a coding education challenge. The, there's three kind of main goals of, of this challenge, of, of this something we're putting together. And it's quite exciting because this is something that is very different to what GNOME has and the GNOME Foundation has traditionally done. This is something that, that is very different from us. So the, the goals is to increase awareness and skills to contribute to free open source software. And this is amongst educators and, and students in particular. Um, it's all very good if people are starting to learn to code, but then how do we make sure that they are able to contribute to free software projects? That requires a, a, a separate skill and a different way of, of contributing. You can't just produce something in a silo. And so it's able to introduce people to free software so that when they progress in their career, um, it's also not just becoming a next, um, going and making the next Fortnite game or, a, or, or the next closed software project. Um, it is to increase the number of people, um, so both youth and adults who are trained in, in coding this free software, and then also interact with GNOME and our technologies. And as I think for those that saw um, Rob's uh, talk before, there is a gap here where it's a mix between just being able to use a block type uh, scratch, for example, a block type programming, and something that's, that's more complicated and larger. And how are we able to sort of bridge that gap to help drive people towards free software? And another of our goals is to increase the number of GNOME contributors who identify as women, non-binary, genderqueer, gender non-conforming, and also to increase the percentage of GNOME contributors who don't identify as white or of European descent. Um, historically, we have been, as I say we, I mean free software in general, has been pretty terrible at actually attracting people from a wider range. And some of that is because um, if you have, we, you traditionally had to be lucky enough to have enough money to code in your spare time to learn to program in your spare time and then do it as a, as a hobby in your spare time. So this is kind of the, the aims of, of this competition. So as for how we're going to do this, this is a crowdsourced competition. We're after new and innovative solutions from a, a wide way, range of groups. Uh, we, we want to gather ideas from a, a really broad base and sort of reaching areas we, we wouldn't otherwise have thought of. As I mentioned, we, we haven't done this before. I'm, I'm not an educator by background. Um, and we want to be able to ensure that we can bring in a wide range of ideas and, and solutions that we can have. Um, there is a three stages to this competition. Um, a ideas stage, a proof of concept, and a final stage. The, the ideas stage is a open submission um, it will be open submission, so anyone can submit their ideas uh, with some detail behind it. And this is to ensure that we have, well, A, sufficient ideas to, to be able to run the competition and to sort of select those which we believe has the greatest chance of, of, of achieving those three goals earlier. Um, 
from this stage, uh, we will have 20 people picked out of this stage who will each receive $6,500. Next, we move into a proof of concept stage, and this really is to demonstrate that these ideas that have been picked are feasible and achievable. Out of this, we pick five of the, of the best proof of concepts, and they receive $25,000 each. Then finally, we have the, the final stage. So we have five people moving into this, um, and this is focusing on uh, turning this prototype, this proof of concept, into an end product that can be used in the future and can be rolled out. Um, as it says here, the first prize is $100,000, and second prize is $25,000. Um, so there is a significant, this isn't a small amount of money just to come and do some, to do some ideas. This is a significant amount of money, and the idea is to generate enough interest and to have people actually engage with it as something that is worthwhile. And this is open to individuals and teams as well. Um, so it, it is a, a, a combined thing that, that people are able to come up with their own solutions. For the judging panel, um, we're expecting a to have a, a, a range of people, so a mixtures of educators, mixtures of people from free software communities, and trying to have that good diverse thing to be able to judge which ideas have the most promise and then where they, where they go from there. In terms of a timeline, um, this is a preliminary timeline, I should point out, um, but we, we're kind of announcing the program and, and more details more widely about, well, now, so about a week earlier from, from, the, from the 1st of September, but, but that's the kind of area we're going for. Uh, we'd be looking to launch it in January and then have everything completed in middle of January next, middle of January 2021. Um, so this is the kind of ideas we're going to go, and so it's a fairly, um, it's a fairly tightened uh, time frame for getting everything in place. Um, but it is our hope that we aim to, um, to, to go with this. Um, obviously, some of, this, uh, may, some of the support that we need to give the program may require recruitment, which can take an amount of time, uh, but that's the, that's the current aim for, for, for where, we're, where we're aiming. So that's a bit more details about um, a, the competition and also kind of our, our plans for the coming years and, and it's kind of strategies for, for, for doing that. So um, I guess it's kind of over to everyone here and I really welcome any questions or any thoughts anyone has on either the, either the overall direction or the competition or, or anything else really. I see a hand up there and one over there. For the competition, do you imagine the winning ideas to come with teams that would go to proof of concept? Or do you imagine that once the ideas are selected, that people would submit bids for proof of concept with new teams? Uh, the former. So the idea is that once, you, once you've been selected and your idea has been successful, you then move on to a proof of concept, then that team would then move on to a final if they're selected again. So the total prize for the sort of eventual winner is... Uh, 131,500, if I've done my maths right. And I know there was a question down here, Matt. Yeah, I also had a question about the competition. So you did mention that you're not an educator. So have you thought, started to think, I know this is very new, but have you started to think about uh, how the how the projects will be selected and what types of people you'll have on the group that's doing the selection. Yeah, so so that's so that's one of the key things that we need to kind of get right is the is the judging panel, uh, for example. So we're reaching out to a few different organisations around. Um, so which I won't mention yet because because we're, <laughs> we're still in discussions with them but it, for me it's really key to make sure that we have the that good diverse thing so it's not just a load of free software people who are coming and doing things who might not know anything about education or know um, what is likely to have a good impact on on, on those goals um, so there's a range of organizations we're talking to as well to try and get judges in and get that experience level we need to be able to to, to work out what we do there Hi, 
I know the 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 GNOME Foundation is facilitating this uh, this cycle. Um, is there a mandate that the technologies have to be built on GNOME technologies, or could they be built on Android technologies? They they don't need to be technologies at all. If somebody comes up with a incredible new um, set of training materials or, or a new course or a new way of delivering education and delivering those things to teach people how to use free software, it may not require any code at all. So it, it, is, a, it is a very open way. What we're after, our goal is to get train people and teach people how to write free software. That's the goal. So it's not necessary to write code yourself. It may be. It may not be. But, and, and I don't know the answer to that, which is why there's this idea of an open question to try and get ideas from, from everywhere. Uh -huh. There's one over there. Has there been any thought to how we're publishing the contest itself and in what circles, like other languages, etc.? Yes, there has. Um, there will be a press release going out soonish, which we hope to get fairly wide coverage of as well. Um, and then obviously social media uh, needs publishing as well, and we're going to try and really quite heavily push. So some of this is... Um, Again, we have this January launch date, so the idea is to essentially have a marketing and outreach plan um, to be able to actually explain, hey, there's this thing going over over here, and it's a really great opportunity, and to be able to reach out to different areas and get different ideas in as well. Um, so that, that is being worked on at the moment. But yeah, it's a really good point, actually, about other languages as well, is to, we need to kind of reach a range of people rather than just stick it on GNOME news site and on the website and then leave it at that. We, we, it is something we do actually need to publicize and market. Um, so yeah, we definitely recognize that. This is a little bit loaded. You don't actually have to answer this question. Um, depending on how this competition goes, is this a, could this be a new type of uh, direction that we would like to see reoccur with different initiatives, with potentially different donor groups being involved? Uh, potentially, yes, if it makes, if it makes sense for us. Um, I, I think it's important that we, um, it's especially important to us as foundation, us as a project and free software in general, that we have essentially new contributors and young contributors coming into free software. Um, I know a lot of us aren't getting any younger, and uh, the time we have spare, uh, the time we have spare is often um, can be taken up by things like families, which is why at Quadec we now have things like childcare that are being offered. And 10 years ago, this wasn't a thing you had to do. So being able to encourage new people and younger people to carry on the, our, our legacy of producing free and open source software is important. So anything which helps that, I think, is a, is a really useful thing and a really interesting thing for, for GNOME and, and free software more, more widely. Now, I should point out it's mostly board members and staff and ex-board members who've been asking questions. Other people can ask questions as well. <laughs> they, they get to ask me all the time in board meetings. Um, so there has been a discussion about, but this doesn't have anything to do with the contest competition for like for a change um, so there has been discussion about the um, environmental impact of the GNOME Foundation um, and we also want to send more people around to conferences and things like that um, does that uh, well should uh, I think the foundation should Considering that as part of like, the overall budget, like the, the, the carbon budget for, for the foundation. Yeah, and, so. and, and, and how do we resolve that conflict? Yeah. Right, okay. Like so Sending people like closer to the conference there, for instance, but. Yeah, um, so I, I've talked to Philip about this quite a lot as well. Um, doo -doo. 
this is the purpose of the foundation. It's very clear that what we can do as foundation has to be serving that purpose. Um, and and that, that everything we do has to be aligned with that. And there is a conflict between what we want to do is reach out to more places, but what we don't want to do is then travel to do that. Um, this, this is a conflict, and, and, and it just is. But there are things we are doing, for example. Um, for example, a lot of the Hackfests, we are co-locating or putting them right by a conference, for example. So if people are traveling anyway, then that's great. There's things like remote participation, which we are hopefully can start to use a lot more of. Um, some of the free software tools are now getting to the stage where it is sometimes usually possible to actually have video calls and not have to use Google Meet, Chat, Face, Hangouts, whatever it's called now, or, or things like that. So there are free software tools that are getting better to be able to, to enable some of this. And that there's other simple things we, we can do. Um, as I think, as I think Philip said, um, one of the biggest actual impacts is use of GNOME software by its users as well. So um, we have things like we do need to travel in some cases, um, and I, I think Philip was saying that, that it's not too about avoiding travel, it's just making sure that when we do travel and when, that when we do things, it is necessary for completing our goal. So we are just have to be a bit mindful and, care, and more careful about when we plan travel and where we do things. So for example, if we are um, moving, say, to Guadec to other places that aren't in Europe, um, then that offers a opportunity for people there not to have to travel all the way to Europe. And it could well be that people who people then choose, like, well, if the year after is going to be in Europe, I don't need to go to every Guadec. I can wait till the one that's just there for us. We're also doing some other things like um, looking at um, travel policies, for example, to potentially make it um, easier or or more viable to take trains, for example, for, especially for short-haul flights uh, where this works, to be able to, to do that and, and, and allow that to happen. Um, because you could also, I think trains are cool. And I can work on trains, and, and that's all fine, rather than, rather than a flight. So there's, there's potential options around there as well. So there's, there's a range of things. We are, in some ways, limited by our mission. And one thing I would say is that where there is a, a direct conflict between the two, it is our mission that we need to serve. Um, so so that, that does come out. But that doesn't mean that we can't also try and improve things as well. One over there and one at the far side of the room after that. I just wanted to make one small point about that, um, which is that oh, there's some conflict with the mission, but then also um, if you try to enable remote participation that can also reach a broader group of people who either can't afford or have children and can't travel, whatever. So there are also uh, upsides. Yes. So you can Oh, yes, absolutely. So, so, so there, are, there are huge advantages to be able to do these things as well. And so where we can um, be more environmentally responsible and also um, serve our mission as well, then that's a win-win for everyone. And this is a, a aim that we should be trying to do. Um, and making sure that, that we can do things like that. It really is just staff and board members and ex-board members who are asking questions here. Yeah, but we can ask Yay, you the... someone in the middle, excellent. Oh, we can ask you the tough questions right now in front of all the people, <laughs> put you on the spot. Um, so building off of these questions about environmental responsibility, I'm curious what other kind of, like, social justice or socioeconomic or, or general doing good responsibilities, we as a community and we as a foundation have, uh, and kind of where are we drawing the lines around what we're going to be focusing on and things that aren't explicitly like developing a great desktop and free software toolkit. So, uh, so I, I think it, it can be quite tricky to essentially go along the lines of, hey, we're going to be doing this and this and these other things, and then we're going to get involved with areas over here and that aren't actually related to free software and our mission. Um, and so that, that is why I keep mentioning this is quite important that we remain focused on this. This is our purpose and where we are. Now, 
where there are areas that um, fit in with our mission, then that's something we can definitely explore and something we can, we can look at. Um, and so part of that is about, uh, I mean, just, for example, be having a good employer brand. Um, we want to attract the, the best people to work for GNOME. We want to attract people who, who, who want to work for GNOME. And with an emphasis on actually we don't just pollute the world is kind of important. Um, so, so there's areas we do fit in, but we do need to also be mindful of not kind of going into the trap of, um, of just because it's something that I think is important or any of our staff or foundation feels important, that isn't necessarily mean it's something that the foundation as a body um, is able to, to think is important. Uh, we, we have to act essentially as a, as a sort of separate body that, that's aiming our, our mission and, and our purpose. So I'm not sure if that answers your question or, 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 or nicely avoids it, but um, either or, um, there was a question in the middle. Hi. Uh, yesterday I mentioned that I had a provocative and a non-provocative question for the board, and then I chickened out about asking my provocative one. Okay. So this means that it's, this might actually be a question that's appropriate for the board, so you can feel free to redirect me if it is. Um, somebody, and I'm not sure if it was you or maybe it was you, Rob, that mentioned that the um, term limit board two-year change proposal yesterday was prompted by some concerns that the donor had about the governance arrangements for the, for the foundation board. So that got me thinking about um, the influence of donors on things that the foundation tries to do. Um, so can we be reassured that if donors request activity, if donors, no, so I'm not talking about the competition here to be clear, because that's clearly yeah. a, a donation to do something, which, which the foundation has decided to do. I'm talking about sort of general donations. Can we, be, can we be assured that the foundation is, is always going to act sort of um, properly if, if donors are requesting things to be done as conditions for them donating money to the foundation? Like, is that something we should be concerned about? I'm guessing you're going to say no, but like, how can we know that things are not happening that you're not able to talk about? You, you should, as a, as, a, as a foundation person, you should absolutely um, be concerned about that, but not because there's there's anything there. But it is a, a standard worry of, of, of what we do. Um, just to be clear, with the um, two-year terms, um, this was not um, a condition of any donor. Um, this was something that I initiated when I first started the foundation. So it hasn't cut, even the idea hasn't come from um, a donor. It has been mine. Um, it is slightly terrifying to me as ED that the entire board can disappear and be replaced by an entire new board um, every single year. Um, so that is entirely mine. In, in terms of actual conditions for donations, um, you, for pure donations, it is very, very hard to, for donors to actually apply any conditions. Um, with grant applications, you need to show how your grant is being used, for example. Um, but that is a, a push out um, towards the grant or, to, to, or you, when you're asking for a grant or a donation, you make a proposal about what you're going to do about it rather than having specific conditions attached. The way, as I understand it, I'm not a lawyer, but the way 50C, uh, 501c3 code works means it's essentially there is a restriction on donors essentially having undue influence over a 501c3. Um, so you, the, there is a lot of careful wording to ensure that there is not undue influence over the foundation. The foundation is required to act independently and in the interest of its own foundation. So I hope that, that reassures a little bit. I think Rob wanted to. Uh, yeah, um, the, the short answer is you should hold us to account. You should hold the board to account. You should hold the foundation to account. That's why the, direct, the directors are elected. Um, what you're holding us to account to is that which is behind Neil, um, and in a sense are responsibly following the legislation that also guides how we run as an organisation. So in the case of, of donations, then 
the IRS provides that a 501c3 can't receive more than half of its funding ish you know, details um, from the same donor so that that donor can't even attempt to exert the, the undue influence. Um, there's also a lot of regulation in the IRS if, you're, if you are a public charity and you claim that essential tax benefit of donations, um, then you can't cause uh, private benefit um, substantially as a part of what you're doing. So there are restrictions as to what the foundation is legally allowed to do. So, I mean, of course, if the foundation appears to not be following the law, then you know, the IRS and all of you should be very, very uh, irritated with us. Um, I think the other thing is that the, the, the foundation, um, over the, since Neil started, and you know, one of the first things that he asked the board to do was implement a uh, conflict of interest policy. Um, so within the board, then, we have all filled in and we must renew every year um, a declaration of any potential commercial interests or holdings that could influence our decision making. Uh, so if it comes up in a meeting, they're like, oh, hey, Endless is talking about donating money to GNOME. Then I say, and Philip Quinto says, I'm, I'm predicting this issue. I'm not going to participate in the discussion or the voting. And then we, we leave that discussion because we can't take part in like, oh, yeah, I think it's a great idea that you do a coding prize. Um, so those things are in place. Um, and you should keep watching, basically, to make sure that those things are in place and those things are being done properly. No, it's great. Um, I would like to also add that this is, those kind of concerns are why a number of nonprofits and political campaigns really look to get as many individual donors as possible. And part of why we want to be shifting some of our focus to uh, increasing the number of Friends of Gnome and increasing the number of individual donors that we have to help make people more confident, but also ensure that the work we're doing is for the community and for the users uh, and for the individuals rather than it appearing as though or it actually putting us at risk where somebody pulls out, like a large corporate donor pulls out and then suddenly the foundation is no longer sustainable. <laughs> Everyone scan the QR code. It does go to a URL shortener. I can see how many of you have done it. If you become a friend of GNOME at this conference, we will tweet a thank you to you, should you so desire, and I will give you a high five. I also have chocolate. Great, so we've got a few more minutes. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? Anything you want to ask at all? No, oh, everyone's taking pictures of the QR code. Excellent, that's fantastic. No? Okay. Well, if that's everyone, then, then thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm obviously going to be around for, for the rest of this and for also the Hackfest coming up as well. Um, so, yeah, please just grab me at any point and, uh, and, and we can have a chat. So, thanks very much, everyone. So, okay. So, so we'll have uh, the unconference talk at uh, 3.30. And in this room will be the product matrix and respecting privacy by Robert McQueen.